We are going to go ahead and explore Expedition Zeta. All right, so welcome to Expedition Zeta. Now I'm going to zoom this all the way out so you guys can get a feel for everything that we have here in the game. A whole bunch of stuff that's going to be off camera for the most part. We have our four player tableaus and a whole nine yards, but during the game, we think we're going to keep it about right here for you guys. All right. So have you ever looked up in the sky at all the stars at the marvel of the universe? Felt a curious nerve inside wanting to travel to these stars, see the planets and maybe find life. Expedition Zeta allows you that chance as you and your fellow travelers each represent a country in a maiden voyage of the first starship to ever use a newly developed warp drive here in alternate history, 1962. The goal is to brave the unknown and collect discoveries in four different star systems. Though you may have to cooperate, one player will bring special fame and fortune to their home country. Will it be you? So as I mentioned, Expedition Zeta includes a basic game for more casual play, but in my opinion, and I think we would all agree, for the best experience, it includes a number of the advanced game modules that we're going to be playing today. There are a number of them that we're going to be playing, and we're going to be playing with most of the modules. Again, this is, in our opinion, the best way to experience the game and get the most out of it. There are a few additional modules that can be added to add to the experience, but this is what I would consider the base modules to include for the Heavy Cardboard audience. I'll briefly uh, mention the modules that we're not including and that we are at the very end of the teach. And then you follow your heart, choose to play with and include whichever ones you want to. So with that said, let's get into it. So what are y'all looking at here? And you know what? We're going to leave it here for now for having it zoomed in like this. We have the main planetary board system. It's a double-sided board with the preparation grid for drafting your starting crew and equipment on the other side. And you'll see what that is when we actually get started since we're going to actually be drafting our crew and equipment. In the center will be the star system and the system that we're exploring. And each of those... Uh, each of that system has some information there as far as where the Goldilocks zones are and how many turns that system will provide us to explore. And we're going to do each of these four times. Those range two to five turns each. Now, each ring that you see on the board represents the possible orbit of planets around that particular system star. They're lettered with different number or lettered spaces as it were. And on the outside, there are numbered spaces all the way around that range from 1 to 12. Now the thick white dotted lines that kind of look like constellations, sort of, are trajectory lines, which are lines in which our ships will be traveling upon to make it around the system. Now on our player boards over here, these are identical boards that where you're going to hold all your cards and other items. So. Over here, we have the turn marker where we're going to start. And again, there's going to be between two and five turns each system. Then there's going to be spaces for alien life cards, both in a current and a stored space. Then knowledge tokens as we acquire them that look like this normally will be face down on these spaces, but those will go in there. And then down below that, substance tokens, which are these little gem looking uh, substances that we're going to be acquiring will be stored there. To the right of that, every player has their own ship card and its special ability or perk, as you can see. Then everybody represents a nation as well, and it has a special perk as well there. Then you'll notice that there are room for four crew members and room for, at most, four equipment cards. However, additional special ones can be acquired later. And these will degrade as they get used up until they get to beyond repair in which they can no longer be repaired. Then there are energy tokens over here. We have the crew level marker and there are also some player aid cards that are off camera as well. Now going back to the main view over here, we have kind of off board, 
we have the mothership. Now the mothership is actually has all four of our ships attached to it. And this is where kind of when they're attached to the mothership, wherever that is, that's where they're going to be. As we take our turns, we're going to pop our ships off and go out and go exploring, etc., etc. Then over here, we have the eight EXO product cards. These are the only eight that will be in the game as we go along. So as these get discovered or created, these will not be replenished. Then we have knowledge tokens. These are the various knowledge tokens that are going to be in our game, but there are additional knowledge tokens which are not, we're not going to be playing with those, uh, with those modules. These will normally reside in that bag, but I just wanted to keep them out to show you guys what those look like. Then to the left of those, we have the large substance tokens, which again, those will be in a bag once we get started as well. And then last but not least, sort of, we have the crew and equipment deck. We're gonna be drafting these uh, before the game begins. More on those as we go along. Now, over here, we also have discovery values. As we go along, three of the main things that we're going to be trying to discover are exo products, these guys up here, substances, those are those gem looking things, as we mentioned, as well as alien life. And these values are what we're going to need to be able to roll in order to discover those things. Now, in addition to all of that, there are the storage trays. So the storage trays look like this. So there is one of them, okay? Now on the storage trays, are gonna be a ton of various different things. And it's they actually work really well for what it is that they're doing. At the very top, as you can see, we have the different star systems. Then down below, we have the planets and Trojans, and I will show you those. The Trojans are basically kind of uh, other uh, like asteroid belt type things that will go along with gas giants and other planets. We also have the various substance tokens, as you can see there, the discovery wheels, which we're actually going to keep out on the main screen. We have the alien life deck, and I'll go ahead and show you a couple of these as well. So various types of alien life, as well as actual alien life forms. And those are going to be worth some amount of victory points at the end of the game, because ultimately victory points or fame points is what we're after. Then we have the Zeta Planetary System Generation Cards. That's a lot of words, but this is, in my opinion, one of the coolest aspects of this game. So you see all of these numbered cards. There are a total of 11 of those. Thank you, sir. So as you can see, and each one has, there is a whole stack of these different cards in which they're going to help us when we roll these dice, randomly generate the system that we're going to then be exploring. In addition to that, we have obviously the 11 dice in the 12 sided dice in the various colors, and we have the quick Zeta cards. So maybe you don't want to roll all 11 dice to be able to, to uh, create your special system. Well, hey, that's all been done randomly for you on these cards there. We'll go into that as we go along. Then there's a number of other items that are off camera that we're not actually going to use today that have to do with other modules that we're not playing with. All right. So again, I'm going to teach the game with the modules that we're playing and what we consider the base game as far as what we're concerned with. But that's the best way that I know how to do this. And I'm also going to be covering our particular mix, like I said, of modules. So that said, let's go over the gist of how you play this game. Now Expedition Zeta is played over, as I mentioned, four system explorations. Each system will be randomly set up at the beginning of that round or, uh, you know, system exploration. So four different system explorations. So players are never no going to know what they encounter until, well, they get there. I mean, it is space exploration mm -hmm. after all, right? Before the game begins, each player is going to choose a nation and a ship that is going to help guide them during the game. Then players can either choose 
pre-generated crew cards, and these look like so. So as you can see here, this is for a two-member crew. It tells you what names and some equipment to use. Or if you prefer, you'll be able to draft and like we're going to draft their crew and equipment. Then they're going to figure out from those drafted who's going to crew their ship and what equipment they're going to be bringing onto the ship from there. Then they'll randomly generate the first system that they're exploring. Then after that, it's time to get exploring. Players are going to take between two and five turns, and those are going to be shown per the system that's on there. Going then two to five turns each, going clockwise around the table. You're going to take your entire turn before play passes on to the next player. On your turn, you may take the following action or actions in this specific order. You may move your ship if you wish to, and then perform one action. That is one turn. Easy enough, right? Yep. You're gonna do this two to five times per star system. Then players are going to regroup back at their mothership to warp to the next randomly generated system and then do it again. At the end of the fourth system, players will count up their fame or their victory points and whomever's gained the most fame wins the game. Now, all of that scoring is done during final scoring. There is no in-game scoring during this game. However, players are going to score fame for the following things. So those alien life cards that I showed you earlier, so oh, we'll just take one of these. For instance, that would be worth five points at the end of the game, as you can see right there. So any alien life cards that are required. Then these exo products. If any of these are discovered or invented or created, fill in the right word. Whatever that number is in the bottom right hand corner there, those are going to be fame points. Then substance tokens that they have left over that they have not spent during the game. These are going to be worth points at the end of the game. Also, helping other players discover alien life and exo products will gain you fame and points. Leveling your crew members. So as you go along, as this advances up here, you're going to be able to flip your crew members over to their leveled side. That will get you victory points. And then finally, when all of your crew is completely leveled up, if you are able to push your level marker all the way up to the nine steps space, that's going to be worth additional victory points as well. And then whoever scores the most points wins the game. So that's kind of a high level of what you're going to be doing in Expedition Zeta. How do you actually play the game? Well, now let's go through that. Again, players take turns in clockwise order with each player performing their entire turn before the next player begins their turn. Each active player's turn is broken up into two potential ship or steps. Move your ship if you want, take an action. All right, so let's go through movement first. In the base game, all it talks about are these rings. It completely ignores the trajectory lines. That oversimplifies it as far as I'm concerned. So we're going to be playing with the movement, uh, with the movement module. Mm -hmm. All right, so, or the trajectory module, which are these trajectory lines out here. So I'm gonna go through a whole bunch of bullet points here and then we'll kind of give you an example of what these look like. So movement is optional. If you start your turn on the mothership, on a Trojan, or if you're somewhere out here in space. If you start your turn on a planet, you must move. You cannot remain on a planet. You can return back to a planet on a subsequent turn, but you cannot remain on a planet. You make one movement action per turn. You're going to pay one energy, which are these tokens over here, so you will discard one of those energy to move anywhere between one and seven steps, all right? Either along these orbit lines, going from these numbers to these numbers to these numbers, etc., or along trajectory lines. You count the white dots, but you do not count location markers or planets that you pass, okay? So let me refresh that. You count white dots, but not location markers. So it'd be one, to two, to three, to four, 
to five to six, etc. Does that make sense? Yep, absolutely. Yes. All right. Travel counterclockwise around an orbit will cost two extra energy. Okay. What does that mean? Well, clockwise is going in this direction. That is how everything in this, in every system will move. So spending that one energy to be able to move clockwise is fine. But if you want to move counterclockwise or anti-clockwise, it will require two additional energy on top of the one that you already spent. However, if you travel along trajectory lines and they happen to go counterclockwise, that does not cost you any extra movement, okay? If you wish to visit a planet, you have to spend one extra energy in which to land on a planet. That also takes into account the energy used to lift off. So when you actually move on your next turn, you do not spend additional energy to lift off because you've already spent it your previous turn to land on that planet, okay? Now, there are certain planets out here that are called gaseous planets or gas giants or uh, various other things. Now, it's a little hard because we're zoomed out, but there is a little tiny little symbol right here that shows that this is a gaseous planet. It's a miniature version of that symbol right there. If that symbol is on a planet and it will only be on the gas giants or the gaseous planets, it requires you to have at least one piece of equipment with that symbol on it in the top left hand corner, okay? These pieces of equipment will degrade every time that they are used. So if you wish to land on a gaseous planet, you're going to have to degrade that one step. If it's already here, you will degrade it another step, etc., etc. If it ever reaches the beyond repair, that's exactly what it means. It's beyond repair. So, in other words, you can get it down to worn out, but if you go past that, you lose the functionality of that equipment. That is bad. Try not to have it go past that point. But ultimately, you are uh, in charge of whether or not that happens, so choose wisely. Now, if you have a star pilot, normally, well, you know what, before we get into any of that, let's go ahead and talk about the movement again. You spend one energy, and if we're here at the mothership, and just because I'm left-handed and I can take this off with one hand, don't mind me, the mothership starts here at I-9, let's say. For this ship to move, it can move up to seven spaces. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, for instance, if it wanted. But let's say it were trying to land onto this tra uh, Trojan, it would go one, two, three, four, boom, landed. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. If, uh, let's say this ice planet were actually right here, it could move one, two, three, four, five, six. If you wanted to get fancy, there's no need. One, two, three, four, five, boom, landed. And one additional energy in which to land on the planet. Easy enough. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I mean, yep. oh, movement yeah. isn't is relatively easy. And if again, if you even if you go counterclockwise, but you're on a trajectory line that is not considered moving counterclockwise, and you don't have to pay the extra two energy. Okay, but let's say there's a planet way out here, and your sh mothership happened to come in to the system here, and you really want to get to it. Well, you're not going to make it there in seven moves. So what can you do with that? Well, that's where the uh, star pilot, if you have one, can come into effect. If you have this symbol in the top left corner of one of your crew, you can move anywhere in the system for one energy, anywhere in the system. You still can't remain on the same planet, however, okay? Now, in addition to that, because we are playing with the equipment module, you also have to use a piece of equipment with the same symbol on it. Easy enough. So if I have that, crew never exhaust, crew never get tired, crew never use their, their uh, abilities up. They just remain. Equipment is what gets used up. So if we did so, we could spend one energy and we could go from 
the mothership all the way over there, and then it would cost one more to land on that planet. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Any questions about the star pilot ability? Nope. All right. Now, if the mothership happened to come into this system, say, on a Trojan right there, or on a planet even, which can happen, if that's the case, there's no movement to and from to get to that place. However, if you're going to land on a planet, it requires one additional energy. You never land on Trojans, so it would cost you no energy in which to do actions while on a Trojan. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. A couple other things regarding movement. These are a finite source, sort of, these energy tokens. So as you can see, if you were to move, that costs one. If you were to move counterclockwise, that would cost a total of three because it's two additional. And then you want to move and land on a planet, that's a fourth one. You have 18 of these on a given game. You have two to five turns per system, and you have four systems. You can power through some energy if you're not careful. So how do you get more energy? For all intents and purposes, there's really only one way to do so. These are radioactive, radioactive substances. These blue substances, you can at any point on your turn, discard one of these and you get four additional energy. Those can be a godsend or a space send as it were. So getting blue substances can be really beneficial if you start running low on energy, which helps you with your movement. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. A couple more things about movement here. If you are the first to land on a planet, you're going to take one of your markers on that planet to signify, hey, I was the first one to land on that planet, like so. You then get whatever substance is shown on that system. That one shows that it's a clear substance. So what, what does that mean I would get one of those clear substances and add it to my tableau? Awesome. If it were a blue radioactive substance, score, I add another one, which can always be for energy, okay? But that bonus is only for the first person that explored that planet, that went to that planet, okay? At the end of the last turn, in which we're about to bug out of this system and go and warp to another system, if you are not on the mothership, no matter where the mothership is, again, going back, if the ship, the system were here, that's okay. We won't leave without you, but it will cost you one energy to just automatically get back to the mothership no matter where you are, okay? So it doesn't matter if you couldn't reach the mothership, and none of that matters. You automatically get transported back to the mothership mm -hmm. for one energy. If you don't have energy to do so, you get stranded. Bad things happen, people can come and rescue you, and when they do so, they can steal your substances, or maybe you gift them <laughs> your substances for keeping you uh, from being stranded in space. You come back to the mothership, you warp to the new system. However, if you're out of energy, you cannot leave the mothership. There are actions in which you can take while on the mothership, mm -hmm. but unless you have blue radioactive energy, you cannot if you are out of energy. Moral of the story, don't be that person. Don't let that happen to you. Plan better. All right? So that is movement. I think we covered it pretty well. Do you mm -hmm. any questions here locally for movement? No. Nope. No? no? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead. Now that we've actually moved to the various locations, and we'll go ahead and put ships in a few different locations here so that you guys can see and we can give the different actions on what's going on. After you have moved, or maybe chosen not to move, as it were, you have a total of four options of actions on your turn. The first one is research. This can be done anywhere, whether you're on the mothership, whether you're on a planet in the Goldilocks zone, more on that in a bit, a planet out on a tra uh, Trojan, or if you happen to be out in space anywhere, you can do this action anywhere. And what research is, is all of these tokens are going to be in this bag. You're going to randomly reach your hand, well not randomly, you're going to deliberately put your hand in the bag, draw two out. 
secretly choose one of them to keep, secretly put one of them back into the bag. You're allowed a total of three of these at any given time. If you choose to draw a fourth, you can do so, but you have to discard down to three. These are basically one-time use markers that coincide some, as you can see out here, we have gaseous planets, we have substance markers, we have exoplanets, we have the star uh, pilot. pilot ability, we have the alien research, and we have warp tokens in there. Okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So, research. Mm -hmm. Draw two, keep one. They're secret. That's the only secret information in the entire game, is whatever you drew out of that bag. You know, but no one else knows. The second action is scavenge Trojans. Any guesses as to where that can take place? Maybe on a Trojan? You are correct, sir. <laughs> Give that man a Cupid doll. Meaning, Trojans, these. Trojans trail and lead around gas giants. When we, when we actually seed systems, you guys will be able to see that in action. But there will be, uh, if there's a gas giant or a gaseous planet out there, there will be two Trojans out there for it. So, when you, you never land on a Trojan, you kind of hover or orbit around it. So to travel to it is one energy. You do not have to spend another because you don't land on it. When you scavenge Trojans, it can only be done at Trojans. You draw two from the substance bag. Those are those giant gems, which look just like the little guys here. Except you're gonna notice there's one other color that we don't have, and that is purple. Purple are wild bonuses. So it, you draw two out, and you get whatever you draw. However, if you draw a purple gem out, or substance, you can choose any of the other four colors. In addition to that, you then put the purple back into the bag, and you draw again. And yes, if you draw another purple, you can choose, put it back into the bag, draw again. So in theory, it could go on in perpetuity, but that's unlikely to happen. So draw two, get whatever it is. If it's purple, draw another. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. The third and simple action is repair. So as I mentioned, your equipment, as you use it, is going to get more and more worn out as you go down. Your crew, as a collective whole, for your turn, you're basically passing your entire turn to do this. You ready? Watch. Take this and move it to slightly worn. Boom, done, that's it. One piece of equipment. I don't care how many are down here in worn out or if they're at substantially worn, that would be kind of a waste of a uh, of a, uh, action. However, you could choose one of these to then move it up to slightly worn because it's never going to be brand new again because you're repairing it, okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's the repair action, boom, done. I'm not gonna ask for any questions because again, pretty simple. And now we get to the meat of the game. This is what's called attempting a discovery. Notice we have discovery values down here in the bottom right hand corner. There are three different types of discoveries in which you can try. Life discoveries, substance discoveries, and exoproduct discoveries. Now, life discoveries can only happen on planets and these can only happen within the Goldilocks zone. So the Goldilocks zone, as shown on the various star types, is going to be where life conceivably could exist within this system. Within this system, it happens to be on A, B, and C. So technically, we have three Goldilocks zones out here. But in our little made-up system that we have here, there's only one planet mm -hmm. that could possibly have life on it. So the other two really don't matter since there's no planets in regards to those. So we only have one. If there were planets out here like so, they are not within the Goldilocks zone, they cannot have life discovered on them, regardless of any modifiers that are on those planets, okay? I, I find it easy to forget this, but thankfully we have the peanut gallery as well as three people that are a lot more cute about this than I am. So if it has a Goldilocks marker, it can possibly have life on it, okay? Substance discoveries are only possible on planets. Planets 
could be within the Goldilocks zone or outside of it. So, Goldilocks zone on planets, any planets, exoplanets or exoproducts can only be done in space, meaning anywhere but planets. So this could be on the mothership, on Trojans, or out in space somewhere, okay? Does that make sense? Those are the prerequisites and where those three things can actually take place. So wherever you are, that's going to limit what type of discovery that you can take on your turn. Mm -hmm. Now, depending, let's say, for instance, we want to try and discover life, whoever this is. And in this case, that's me. That's the <laughs> octopus. That's my ship right there. So if I have traveled, I just moved, I paid my movement, paid my energy, whatever it was, which... One, two, three, four, five. Okay, let's let's see. If we were to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and maybe it would have taken a second turn to get there. But I did so and I landed on that planet. And I say, I want to attempt to discover life. That planet is within the Goldilocks zone. Okay, that is a viable possibility. Now, in order to do so, I have to have at least one crew member with the alien life symbol alien life symbol you guessed it is the little green alien head on that you'll notice that i have two crew members that have that every crew member must also have a paired piece of equipment in which to discover anything whatever the type of discovery is and also i would like to point out that not only is the color coordinated but the symbols are coordinated so life is the little green alien head Substance is the little red rock, and exo products are the little yellow or goldish ship symbols. So you'll notice here we have the ship symbol for exo products, we have the substance, and we have alien life. Okay, make sense? Mm -hmm. So I have two alien life. I could choose to send one or both of my crew to try and discover that. Let's say I choose to do both, and this is how it was. That would wear that out a little bit and wear that one out. So each crew member has an associated piece of equipment on it. Then, if another player's ship were actually on that location with me, they could, if they so desire, and I ask them to, help. What does that mean? Well, if whosever ship that is, which in this case that's Derek's, if he also had at least one crew member with at least one piece of equipment that both have the alien symbols on them, he could assist. He could assist with more crew and equipment, again, on a one-to-one -one basis as if it were me doing that. And I'll explain why he might want to do that in a little bit. But he, he, if no one's there, then it's a moot point. I'm on my own for that. After that, we then determine how many dice I get to roll. Well. I have two crew, which means I have two equipment out there. Well, I get two dice, normally. What dice you roll do not matter because they're always D6s or D12s, I'm sorry, in this case. But in addition to that, there are two modifiers on a given planet, and I'm going to actually show you guys those here. So you see, this is a carbon uh, planet. You'll see the plus two in green, and you'll notice the minus one in red. If I were doing a substance discovery, I would roll one less die. If I'm doing a life discovery, I roll two more dice on it. So in that case, I actually get four dice. Very nice. All right. So I would roll four dice. You might be asking yourself, what are we rolling for? And that's where that number comes into play. So you need to roll that number or lower to succeed. Ooh. It does not matter how many successes you get. I have four dice. If I get four successes, doesn't mean I'm four times successful. I'm successful, whether I roll one, two, three, or four successes. So we roll. Hey, we succeeded. We rolled a three you need on four. one of them, okay? <laughs> so I would succeed, okay? If I did not roll a three or lower on any of the dice, I fail. So now let's go through what that means, whether I succeed or whether I fail. All right, so if it succeeds, the first thing you're going to do, if you rolled the dice, which I did, you're going to move your level marker up one space. Again, does not matter how many times you succeeded, you move it up once per die roll. Then, 
After that, we're going to go ahead and draw one life card. So one alien life from the deck. So we draw one of these, we flip it over, and it comes over here into our current, if it's there. It doesn't do anything for us, but it's six points at the end of the game. If it were an alien one, which looks a lot like the alien head ones, much like this, they essentially become a crew member for us. This says plus three dice to discovery actions on specific types of planets. Awesome. So they become a crew member. So what that means is I, if I had a space, I could put them down here as a crew member, or they can just hang out up here in the current slot. If I get an additional one, then that one would come over here to my crew. The only exception to this is aliens cannot be trusted to do discoveries on their own because they're alien, I guess. So what does that mean? That means they must be assisted by at least one human and everybody needs a piece of equipment. Aliens are set thought to have all of the symbols so they don't need any of that, okay? So in other words, what happens? They must have a piece of equipment, but they become an extra crew member and they're worth a whole lot of points at the end of the game. So that's, that's the general gist of how all three discoveries are made. Any questions on how life discoveries are made? Uh, nope. Okay, nope. all right, cool, easy enough. So let's go over then how, uh, how substance discoveries are made. The exact same way. Substance, however, if you succeed on a substance one. And again, substance are the rock symbols. So you'll notice I only have, I have two crew, but I only have one piece of equipment. That means I could only send one person, which means I would only get one die roll. However, if one of my crew members that is being sent, or if the crew member being sent is leveled, they also need one piece of equipment just like normal, but they actually roll two dice. That's the benefit of having them leveled. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if she were leveled and I send that piece of equipment with her, I would actually get two dice. This planet where I'm on says minus one. I actually, that means I only roll one die. I need a seven or lower. I succeed. What happens on a substance that succeeds? I take two substances of the type that are on that planet. That happens to be blue. Mm -hmm. Hey, awesome. So I actually would get two of those substances to put onto my tableau, add it to there, boom, done, easy enough. Okay? Mm -hmm. Exos products work the exact same way, but on the yellow spaceship symbol. Everything works the same. I would have to roll a five or lower. However, now, when you succeed, that gives you the privilege and opportunity to be able to invent or claim one of these eight Exo products that are in the game. There's a huge stack of them, and these are the only eight that we're going to be playing with today. What matters are the three right symbols in the top right corner. If it's empty, don't worry about it, it's empty. But this would require two blue substances, two radioactive substances. So I would have to turn those in, which means I can't turn them in for energy. Whereas this one requires two black and one blue, etc., etc. One red, one black, one white. They're worth victory points at the end of the game. In addition to that, their equipment. So whatever the symbol is in the top left corner is just like one of these symbols that is over here on your piece of equipment. It can degrade just like the others. The kicker on this is if it goes to beyond repair, you can't use it anymore, but you do score the victory points at the end of the game, even if it's completely worn out. Okay? So that is what happens if it's a successful uh, discovery for all three types, be it life, substance, or exo products. If, in our example, Derek had sent one to his entire crew with their equipment, I would roll the dice because it's my discovery. What he would get for doing so is we would take, if I succeed, I'm going to take his symbol or his flag and put it onto there. At the end of the game, he's going to get exactly half the amount of victory points 
that I got. He doesn't take them away from me, so I would get eight, he would get four. They're just, hey, that's what he gets. If it, that's for an exo product. If it were for an alien discovery, he would get half those points at the end of the game. If it were a substance, he's going to take one of the substances, whereas I got two. But just like on a regular player, on his board, I don't physically take his crew, nor do I physically take his equipment. Mm -hmm. However, he does degrade his own equipment because it got used on a discovery it was just on loan, so to speak. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Last but not least, if you fail, so let's say I needed to roll a three or lower and I rolled a five, you draw one of the knowledge tokens out of the bag and you keep whatever you draw. You don't get two, like when you take the research action, it's the, that's the consolation prize, you get a knowledge token. If you help somebody and they fail, you degrade your equipment. Okay, good. All right, moving on. Any questions on the available actions in the game? Nope. All right. The last things that we should go over, and I'm not going to go over it in detail, is the system generation. How do you actually generate the system there? That is all off camera. It will go on camera when we do so, but honestly, we're going to walk you through that step-by-step -step process as we go along. And I think that anything more than that would be kind of over the top for right now. After everybody has taken their one turn, the turn marker gets moved, then all planets and Trojans move one step clockwise on the board. So what does that mean? Well, where this planet is, it started at B4 or six, it would move clockwise one. We'll move that to remind us where it is. If you're on the planet, Hey, guess what? You move with the planet. All of the Trojans would then move on. The planets move, etc., etc. So everything would move. The mothership, or if you were out in space by yourself, do not move in that case. Then we repeat the exploration for the number of turns. So if that was the first turn, we would do that two more turns. Then at the end of the last turn, remember all ships will transport spend one energy and make it back to the mothership if they're not already there okay and that's it once we are ready to bug out when we're getting ready to leave for the next star system all cards that are on uh on our boards if there are any that are used because everybody has a special perk or special ability if those are flipped over to the use side and it says once per system we flip those back over just like so then we remove any flag markers from the planets that are out here. Then we completely wipe the board because we're going to a new system. Then we're gonna pass the start player to whoever has the most knowledge tokens and we'll use player order to uh, break any remaining ties that mm -hmm. there might be. And then we actually we discover, see. yeah, we, we receive, we discover the system, mm -hmm. do it all over again, do that four times. Then going into final story, which I kind of briefly touched on, but let's go over it again real quick. You get total points from alien discoveries and alien life, as well as exoplanet points. Then any substances left over at the end of the game, Anything with a color, red or blue, those are worth two points a piece. Black and white are worth one point a piece. You're going to get any fame for anything that you assisted with. So in this case, Derek will get five and a half points. You will get two points for every leveled crew member. So potentially up to six. And if they're all leveled, and then this pushed all the way up to the nine steps, after having leveled everybody and this resetting after they level, you then get nine points for that. Whoever has the most points wins. And that, in a nutshell... Is the most famous. There you go. And that, in a nutshell, is how you play Expedition Zeta. All right. So any questions? Go for it. Yeah. Trey, you've been watching chat, so go for it. Well, uh, you and Clara had a couple of things for, for the uh, ch chat. That um, uh, if you're... Um, if you're using multiple crew members, you don't ha you don't have to use uh, ones that uh, have the icon that you're rolling for. 
Um, uh, and if you use a single equipment for multiple crew members, it'll degrade that for the number of crew members who use the equipment. Fair, fair enough. So, okay. So what we're talking about is, let's say I had this situation where these two are going to go out for life. For, for to discover alien life. And they're both going to use that same piece of equipment. They can do so, but it's going to degrade two times. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or it could degrade just once, and that can move over like so, one mm -hmm. apiece, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. There's a couple of other things. Um, the planetar um, planets um, always have life, as a, even if they're not in the Goldilocks zone. Um, and, uh, and the... Um, when you're drawing, when when you when you first land on a planet, if you the you have the option of taking the one that's there, you could instead draw from the bag. Right, correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So we will reset everything, and then we're going to go through the. Uh, you know what? Actually, before we do that, let me go ahead. Let me see the rule book, and I want to list all of the modules that we're actually mm -hmm. playing with, right, yeah. and the ones that we are not playing with okay like, like the romance right so we are playing with module one slash two or what the equipment module we're playing with we are playing with the alien civilization module or the alien life one we are not playing with the warp travel module we are playing with the trajectory module and we are playing with the zeta psg module which is the uh, planetary system generation one we are playing with the perks and that's it. So the damage, the Z, uh, Xeno archaeology ones, we are not playing with. So just to be clear, okay? And there's also a solo rules, but obviously we're playing a four-player game. So there we go. Okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And Yoon, anything else? Go for it. And let me reset my board. We need to clear this because we actually need to do the draft now. There we go. So I didn't talk about this for the simple fact that, well, I figured we would go over it and it makes it easier for you guys to actually see it as we go along. Now, everybody should have 18 energy and we're going to put them all right here so you guys can kind of draft along with us. Should probably, when we use them, pull them back. Yeah. Okay. Just, Just put them onto your player board at that point. Sounds okay. great. Okay, so we have shuffled up the equipment deck and the crew deck so that, and there are 20 crew that are removed from the deck. So it's a random mix of what comes out where. And before we draft, does anybody have Schwazi? No. Derek, do you? Yeah, of course. But of course. Okay, so we will have those there. So while he's getting that, I'll go ahead and run through how the draft works. Whoever's the first player is going to expend, they're going to expend energy based on where they are underneath here. So three energy, two, three, four, three, four, five, four, five. And when they do so, they're going to take one of their flag markers and place it onto that crew or equipment they own that piece of equipment. Then if it happens to be in the bottom row, they then claim that piece of equipment or that crew member, and then that will go out onto their board. If it's not on the bottom row, it stays there. Then it goes to the next player, they purchase one, etc., etc. So if, however, I were to say, claim this one, it's at the bottom row, I take this, now I have this hole to fill. I choose how to move it orthogonally adjacent, meaning either straight down or across. So let's say this one looks pretty good, so I want to leave him there, but he has the star pilot ability, and I want to make him more expensive for the player that goes next. So let's say I move this around like so. I put that there. The gap must be in the top row when you're done moving these over then that next card will come out and fill any spot or spots that are there. We keep going around and around until we're all out of energy. Whatever we have drafted, we then choose from that to put onto our player board and begin the game. Mm -hmm. You do not have, 
to take all of your crew. There might be reasons why you only want a two-person crew. Easier to level, you can get to the nine steps quicker, etc., etc., but they're not as flexible as other ones. The one piece of advice that I would give to everybody is try and make sure that you have at least one of the three main symbols in the game, meaning alien life, substance, and exoplanet. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. And that's pretty much the draft. Then we're all going to start with 18 energy and the game will begin.